Hi, my name is Albert. I'm a PhD student from UC Berkeley, and today I'm going to talk to you about writing a fertile transformation or making your own simple CAD tools for fun and profit. At first, a little bit about me. I work in the ADEPT lab at UC Berkeley, and I help maintain Chisel and Fertile. I've been working with Chisel since about 2013, and I currently work on tools that help uh, improve quality of results and user friendliness in FPGA simulation. And so I'm especially interested in how we can take chisel designs and make them into better FPGA simulators, leveraging features of the language. So uh, as uh, Sagar mentioned earlier, I currently work on the uh, fertile based compiler for the FireSim project. And I also enjoy DIY CAD tool hacking with Chisel and Fertile, whether it be for research projects or to try and help people uh, when they need to make some kind of emergency change to tape out or something like that. And I think that uh, writing fertile transforms can be a really uh, low barrier entry way to uh, you know, solve a problem that might come up in RTL design. And so uh, the logistics, basically I started out, I thought, okay, Two hours, that's really long. I can probably compress mine down to an hour now that we're only two tracks. But then I realized there's a lot to talk about. I am not 100% set on whether I should talk about you know, uh, basic things or interspersed tips and tricks and things like that. So there is a code template, and there are a few places where you can type in code, but that eats up a ton of time. So uh, you're welcome to follow along, but it's not necessary. Uh, and if you do want to follow along, you're going to need the same stuff you'd need to run the chisel template, which includes Verilator. And uh, I uh, am going to release these slides uh, with like an expanded two-hour version that goes into developing a more complicated for all transformation. Uh, but for now, I'll just introduce some basics and then allude to uh, parts of that. Uh, so uh, basically, if you want to follow along, the set of instructions, the URL is uh, UCB bar slash fertile transform template. And people want to Google that or something, a few seconds. But basically, uh, this is based on the chisel template, and it's kind of a low overhead way of putting extra transforms in. And uh, it relies on a lot of the things that have been talked about earlier today, which include Basically, the chisel template uses a tester, and the tester kind of uses the same kind of unified command line option interface that uh, something using a stage or a phase would have. And that allows you to just specify, I have this custom transform in my project, and I'm going to run it. And the transforms are located in, uh, in GCD slash tool. So uh, what I'd first like to do is talk about the general structure of a fertile transform, and then talk a little bit about existing APIs and give a brief explanation and uh, do some examples while I'm at it. Um, I want to talk about like the concerns that a transform has to handle, and uh, not necessarily about the source code in detail. And um, I think if there's plenty of source code examples, there are a lot of transforms in the fertile repository that vary in length and complexity enormously. So I am just going to try and touch on the steps that they go through and the APIs that they use. Uh, so some of these things are under active development, and I try to flag some of those that are of particular note with the active development signal. And uh, this tutorial includes some concepts that might be annoying now and might get much easier soon. And we love your feedback, so if anyone has any kind of feedback about, uh, you know, problems you might uh, come across or things you might think are limiting, uh, please share it with us on GitHub. Uh, so uh, fertile transforms touch on several concepts. So uh, in order to take one fertile circuit and transform it into another fertile circuit and either preserve its functionality, change some aspect about it, add extra hardware, generally you would want to have a very good working knowledge of the fertile specification. Not because it's necessary to know every single word in it, but because sometimes knowing it a little bit better can radically simplify the code implementation. Um, also, uh, I'm just going to use some pretty basic Scala programming paradigms here. 
but there are a lot of cases where if you have a transform that analyzes the connectivity of something and passes that around throughout various stages of the transformation, it might save a lot of time to use uh, functional programming with higher order functions or more complicated data structures. There are also quite a uh, significant number now of internal fertile APIs, and today I'm going to talk about just transforms, a little bit about annotations, uh, but the number of APIs is, has, has grown, and so it can be a little daunting to keep track of that. Uh, and also, uh, probably the best resource of all is existing fertile transforms. And this is not just because an existing fertile transform might do exactly what you want to do, but one of the strengths of writing a furl transform uh, is that if you have a transform that adds a feature, then it might not actually produce a circuit that's like totally cleaned up and ready to go. It might have some elements about it. There might be analyses in the circuit that are now broken that you need to fix up. And if you realize that there's this large collection of transforms that can kind of take over the rest of the job for your transform after you've done the key bit that you actually want to change, then you can save a lot of extra work. And so uh, in this vein, uh, beyond just the existing transforms in the API, there is a lot of reusable code in other transforms and utility APIs that might be packaged in objects alongside those transforms. And this is kind of a blessing and a curse because one thing because the default access modifier in Scala is public, and because uh, none of us ever learn our lesson, pretty much all of these are public, and that is not necessarily by intent, but if you just kind of, if you want to do something and you look through a bunch of transforms, chances are there's probably something that whether or not they intend it to be a library exists that you can use as a library. Uh, so for one example, something that comes up a lot is that if you write a fertile transform, it's a source-to-source -source transform. A lot of times, if you think about adding a piece of logic in your design, changing a flip-flop to some other kind of, of uh, synchronous state element, you would think of it in terms of you have a graph that represents your netlist, and you're just going to jam a piece of hardware in there. And that, if you have a netlist graph, is pretty easy. But if you have a source-to-source -source transform, the circuit is not actually structured that way. And some transformations that modify the netlist might be easy, Others might need you to actually analyze the netlist of some subset of the circuit in order to figure out what to do. Uh, many pieces of code in the FURL repository deal with looking at at least some component of the netlist of the circuit. And these include the instance graphs, uh, wrapped expressions, which aren't really quite netlist, but if you have two expressions that refer to the same piece of hardware in different contexts, from a abstract syntax tree perspective, they might not look the same because the context in which they are used might change some elements of their metadata. And if you want to compare them and say, are they pointing at the same wire, they're not the same thing. So there are utilities to do that. There's also a library for dealing with memories that allows you to you know, find what's driving the port of a memory if you want to uh, transform the behavior of it. So uh, the first step is to look at the in-memory representation of the fertile IR. So this is a circuit. Uh, you've probably all seen this before. And this is basically just passing through input to output. And if we take that and we parse it, then this is kind of a classical textbook AST representation of what that would look like. And uh, I dropped some fields for simplicity, but basically we've got a circuit. It's got a module and the circuit points to what the top level module is and the module has ports and it also has a statement body. And uh, one key thing to note is that because there is a, a block statement that can include multiple statements, a module actually only has one statement as its body. Uh, and the statement is a connect here and it has a, uh, a reference to the input on the left hand side and a reference to the output on the, left -hand, on the right hand side. This is not a true for AST. There's some fields and attributes and children missing, but this is generally what you're working with. So a uh, circuit contains at least one def module. A def module is an interface that can be implemented either by a module 
that's defined in FERL or a black box external module. A module has a sequence of ports and a body, uh, which is a statement. A statement can have a type, which might have a width. And uh, here, kind of at the top level, you're dealing with the module, which, as I said, a module is basically a fertile native defined module, and an X module is a black box. And you also have statements, and uh, I'm not going to go through all these, but basically, uh, much like an imperative programming language, there's simple control flow operators, and there are connections, and there are declarations of different types of hardware. And then uh, at a lower level in the tree, you have expressions, and these uh, include dynamic and static indexing of vector types, and also uh, subfield accesses and various kinds of primitive operations, which are in the, the do prim expression. So IR nodes are represented with Scala case classes. And a case class is kind of like a, a tuple, but it's given a name for its particular type. And the idea is that it's a product of multiple member fields. And the kind of philosophical meaning behind that is that if you have a case class and it has a bunch of fields, it's kind of identified as like a particular instance of that case class purely by those fields. Those are the contents of the product, and then that's kind of its identifying signature. You can define other members, but they should be kind of utility functions. Uh, and as a result, it by default, this interface in Scala uh, uses value equality. So when you have two pieces of fertile IR, if they have the same contents and you compare them with equals, then they will be equal. And uh, this is really commonly used to represent ASTs of any kind of uh, parsed language in Scala. And uh, here we have an example of this uh, connect statement. Uh, this is the actual uh, definition of the connect case class. And it has uh, several fields, uh, loc and expr are basically left-hand side and right-hand side, and those are both expressions. So here, if we look at this connect, output equals input, uh, we've got the left-hand side, we've got the right-hand side, and then we have this mysterious info field um, that appears in a lot of statements, that appears in basically all the statements and also appears in module definitions. Um, that is not actually needed to be modified, it does not actually need to be modified in most real transforms. It holds uh, kind of source locator line number information. So basically, the info field might hold a data structure that, when the Verilog eventually gets emitted, allows it to be a friendly comment on the right-hand side uh, that tells it what line and what chisel source file it was generated in. Uh, there are also a number of built-in transforms to lower fertile IR. So if you start out in high fertile, then there are a number of features that you have to remove to get mid-fertile, which include unspecified widths. Uh, fertile has width inference, so you don't have to give integer types explicit widths, but by the time it reaches mid-fertile, you can guarantee that that's been removed. There are the conditional statements, which work in a manner pretty much identical to Verilog if, and there are also last connect semantics, which also works similar to Verilog uh, assignments, where if you have one assignment and another assignment, they kind of have that procedural nature where one that happens lower in the file is considered to follow it and overwrite it. And when you lower from mid form to low form, you get rid of aggregate types. And so Chisel has bundles. Fertile also has bundles. And same with vectors. And you also get rid of partial connect statements, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later what exactly those mean. So fertile semantics are not covered in detail here, so see the spec for more info. Uh, but today, I don't have time to work through the whole transform, unfortunately, but I'm going to make a couple references to triple modular redundancy as an example of transform. And so this is a general technique for high reliability circuits. And in a nutshell, you have three copies of the circuit, and you have a voter, and the voter determines, based on the majority, what the correct value is. And if you have feedback in your circuit, you use this majority value to scrub any errors as state elements. And this allows you to withstand one fault without corrupting any data coming out of your circuit. 
So if you have an error in copy zero, still good. Uh, and so specifically, this transform uh, conceptually would apply triple modular redundancy to registers to correct soft errors. And this is in the repo, so you can take a look at it if you want, um, and I'll put some info on that later. So basically, uh, to transform a circuit with the resilient registers, if you were using a netlist and you just wanted to write a graph-based netlist transform, you would kind of just do something like that, jam the registers in, jam the majority data in, and the problem is, in Fertile, you're doing a source-to-source -source transform. So it's not quite quite the same as what you might think of classically with CAD tools. Um, and again, Fertile does not natively operate on netlist graphs. So here, if we have a transform that triple modular redundancies uh, the registers in the design, and you apply that transform, you get a new circuit. The problem is, if you just have a transform that takes a circuit, does that transform to every register, now every single register in your design has triple modular redundancies which is really expensive and makes your design a lot worse. So in a real world design, you would identify certain registers that maybe are more susceptible to soft errors or would have greater consequences if they uh, had a soft error within, and you might rely on other error correcting techniques at different points in your circuit. So you want to be able to control this better. And this is where the concept of annotations comes into play. And Adam, kind of mentioned a lot of this earlier, so if you saw his uh, saw his slides, this might be a little bit redundant, but uh, basically an annotation, if you mark, say, a resilient register annotation on a register, then you are targeting a component, and here a component could mean a register, a wire, a node, uh, which is a wire that's immediately and continuously assign an expression, kind of like a continuous assigned wire in Verilog, and uh, it could be an instance or a module, and it tells a transform usually to do some particular action to that component. So here, basically we put this annotation on one of the registers, and then the idea is that our transform will selectively find and operate only on the targeted component. And uh, when you associate these annotations with circuits, then you end up with a circuit state. And so uh, in Fertile, a transform, which is the main API for uh, dealing with any component of the compiler, uses a circuit state as both its input and its output. And so a circuit state contains the circuit, which is the actual IR nodes of the RTL design, the form, and this is just for convenience and performance, it's labeled with its current form. By looking through the circuit, you could see what features it uses and infer what its form is, but it's easier to just keep that around. Annotations, uh, and here, uh, for the sake of this uh, discussion, I'm going to be talking about using annotations as a means to control transforms and renames. So one concrete example of this is if we have an annotation Say we have this resilient register annotation on a register, but we also have some other annotation on that register. If we now have our transform split that register into three, the downstream transform that was consuming the other annotation will not be able to succeed because the register that it was pointing at has been replaced by three new registers. And so renames are an API, which I'm only going to talk about very briefly at the end, but they allow you to tell the rest of the compiler flow, hey, I took this component, I replaced it with these components or one other single component, update your annotations accordingly. And so a transform acts on a circuit state and produces a new circuit state. And uh, looking at a concrete example of this, we can look at a few very simple fertile transforms. So this is kind of a variation of something that actually exists in Fertile Now, which is the identity transform. And here we just return the state. And uh, you know, my main goal with this talk is kind of point out things that might be interesting. Uh, and so I might jump up between uh, between issues and, and actual code. But the uh, identity transform, if it returns the same state, well, 
for now, we don't really know what form we want to take as the input and the output. So we've used the best possible Stella expression for the input and output form. But let's say, okay, we want to make it high form. The problem is now, if we have this transform, if it operates on high form, it can accept any input at all because a low form or mid form circuit is a legal subset of high form. So if your pass accepts high fertile, it can take any fertile circuit. The problem is we said the output form is high form. So when this transform runs, the compiler thinks the output of this transform is in high form. So if you put a circuit that happens to be low form into this transform, when it comes out, uh, as far as analyzing how you need to order your passes, this has to be re-lowered again, and that is, uh, it comes to the performance cost. So you say, okay, well, now we're just going to change it to low form. The problem is, this is actually a different transform, and you can no longer run it on an arbitrary input. And this, if you look in the actual uh, fertile repository, there is an object identity transform uh, that has a factory method to make different forms of the transform for different input and output forms. So that if you, you know, you can't just have one identity transform, you have to have different ones for different input output forms. So the forms are the good spec for actually writing out the spec of the written fertile IR, but they're not a very good API for trying to make sense of what order you run your compiler passes in. So they suggest the logical layering of the compiler, and if you have a basic flow from input high fertile to Verilog, it makes a lot of sense. The problem is when you break this linear chain by adding in custom transformations, you don't just add them in the middle. You might rerun built-in transforms multiple times, and it gets very confusing because they are both conservative uh, when you label something as the output form being high form, and in many cases, it's, you know, it's kind of just implicitly correct because the order has been the way it has been and reordering transforms can actually cause bugs because the forms don't capture subtleties about what actually changes between passes. So it's insufficiently expressive. And if you use one high form feature in your pass, then the output form has to be high form. If you, if there's one feature in high form like uh, multiple connect statements or something that you don't like, then you can't say that you take high form anymore just because you don't like that one feature. Usually when you write a transform like the identity transform, the true output form depends on the input form. And that's bad because, you know, in theory you could have your compiler dynamically check the form of each circuit all the time and dynamically pick what order to run passes in. But it's better for your compiler for you to say, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the context of these fertile and chisel generators, a lot of things end up happening dynamically because the compiler is kind of a program in an embedded language too. But we want to be able to say at the start of our flow, before we even look at design, what is the order of passes that I'm going to run in this stage of my generator? And so uh, Skylar talked about this a little bit, but coming soon, dependency API, orange cone, so instead of saying input form is high form, we can say what are the prerequisites and what are the invalidates. And if we have the identity transform, you can run that on anything. So it doesn't have any prerequisites and it doesn't change the circuit. So it doesn't invalidate any transform. So this can accept any input, which is the property that we desired before. But the nice thing is it doesn't obligate any transforms to run after it. So sounds good. Uh, but then, just for now, we're going to go back to the low form identity transform. So this is kind of boring because it doesn't actually change the circuit in any interesting way. But we can look at a little bit more complicated transform that actually does something which I'm going to call partialized connects. And so a fertile partial connect statement is basically a more general version of a connect statement. It allows the left-hand side and right-hand side to have different types. And uh, as a side note to this, it also handles analog types, which are uh, used to represent things like tri-states and trouble. It connects fields in a manner that's borrowed from a programming language concept of structural types, 
where, uh, and this is described in detail in the fertile stack, and it's definitely the best place to check it out, but it basically uh, it looks at matching fields in different kinds of bundles and connects them based on their names and types matching. And so if we turn every connect in the design into a partial connect, it is still legal. So here we have this pass-through circuit again, and if we run this partialized connects transform, what we want to end up with is the same thing, but with a partial connect from input to output. And again, it does the same thing. So here we're going to look at the outline, and uh, here the little code font starts. So if we have this slightly more complicated transform, for now we're going to say, okay, we're going to add partial connects. Let's be conservative. We are unlowering our circuits. So we'll say the input form is low form and the output form is high form. And the general structure of a lot of fertile transforms starts out looking like this. And so at the bottom we have our execute method. And the execute takes a circuit state as an input and returns a circuit state. However, this time it doesn't just return it unchanged. It applies a function uh, to it and the actual specific implementation, it calls a method called map on the circuit. And it passes a function into that, which is the on module method. And that, again, calls this map operator. And so uh, a couple things to note here. Uh, the partial connect is illegal in low form, so we are outputting high form. And we're using these mappers. So mappers are a very convenient way to transform fertile IR. They're kind of inspired by the classical function, functional programming map. Uh, and a confusing thing when you're writing a fertile map or, or writing a fertile transform is that regular Scala higher order maps appear all over the place. And they appear sometimes in very close proximity to calls to fertile statement expression module mappers. And so uh, you kind of have to be very careful when you look at the type of the thing that the map method is being called on. Are you looking at a regular Scala collection map or are you looking at one of these fertile mappers? So a few key differences. Uh, they're not type parameterizable and I'll circle back at the very end to why that is important. Uh, the IR node map is a method of a single node, not a list of nodes or any other data structure or collection of nodes. And it applies a function to all appropriately typed child nodes of that node. And I'll say in a moment what that means. Each node has overloaded map methods. And so different nodes might have different types of child nodes. And they have an appropriate map method to transform each of them. So types of child nodes. A circuit has zero or more deaf module children. <laughs> A def module has zero or one statement children. Each statement has potentially some number of statement children and possibly even some number of expression children. And there are more, but we're going to ignore some of the you know, finer details like type width and info for now. So uh, just looking in detail at what these mappers actually do, if we want to map over the modules in the circuit, if the circuit has zero to n def module children, it can define a map that takes a function that takes a module as an input and returns a module as an output. If you provide this function to the mapper, it will return a circuit with a set of modules corresponding to having applied s to each of the modules in the original circuit. One thing that you might know if you're familiar with traditional functional programming mappers or maps is that if you have this circuit and it has a list of modules in it, then Scala already gives you collection-based higher order map functions and also gives you very convenient ways to copy the case classes that the IR nodes happen to be represented by. So here, circuit.map, you can just do circuit.copy which allows you to change named fields of the case class and give it a new list of modules that you just use the built-in Scala collection map function on. So why did we invent a new weird mapper just to do that? Well, the statement mappers get a lot more interesting. 
So statements can contain statements, and they can also contain an expression. And the number that they contain varies between different types of statements. So here we have two connects, and they're contained in a block statement. The block statement has two statements as children, and the connect statements have two expressions each as children. So the mappers abstract details of the node subtypes. And what I mean by that is that we have blocks, we have connects, we have def register, def wire. These are all extending the statement interface, and they all ex inherit the abstract mappers. So they have a map function that takes a function from statement to statement that transforms all their child statements. And so if you apply that to a block, it will apply S to every statement contained in the block. But they also have an expression mapper that takes a function from expression to expression. And if you apply that to a connect, it will transform all the child expressions, the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the connect. If you apply the expression mapper to a block, it will just return the original block unchanged because the block does not have any expression chosen. So we have many different types of statements. And the nice thing about the mappers is that sometimes you want to look at particular types of nodes, but sometimes you just want to traverse the IR uh, node hierarchy as quickly as possible with as little code as possible, and you don't want to have to examine and have a special case for each one. So the concrete implementation for each type carries a lot of the information that you'd otherwise have to duplicate in every transform you write. So back to the transform. So here we have uh, two calls. So now we know that if we call circuit.map on module, it's applying on module to every module and making a new circuit. And if we call module.map transform statement, we know that the body of the module is getting transformed with the transform statement function. So the net result is we have a circuit state with this function, transform statement, applied to the statement body of every module from the circuit of the original circuit state. And that's a mouthful. And so it, it, you can see it pays to break apart the IR node traversals and different functions, because otherwise it gets very complicated pretty quickly. But one key phrase there, and if we flip back, it's the statement children of every module. And if we look at, if we look at the module class, it has one statement as a direct child. It has the body. And that means that if you had a flat hierarchy in, in, the, in the graph and you called the map on it, it would apply to all of the children. But if you have a child that is the body of the module and it itself has statement children, it does not apply this function to their children. In other words, the mappers aren't recursive. So in order to actually make it recursively transform the entire circuit, we need a recursive function for recursive node types like statements. So here, uh, our basic transform statement that just returns the identical statement. If we change that so that it recursively calls itself, now it actually gets applied to every statement in every module. But it still is nothing. Uh, and so how can we build this up to actually do something? So we can use pattern matching. Uh, this is something that you also see in pretty much every fertile transform. And in Scott, and this is, you know, uh, just a general Scala feature. But what happens a lot is because the statements, expressions, all the node types are actually case classes, they define uh, what's known as an unapply. And when you have an unapply with the name of a case class, like disconnect, you can fill in names positionally. And if we look back uh, at the definition of the connect, uh, then the connect has three fields. It has info, it has loc, and expression. And here, the unapply is actually defining these new values, info, loc, and expression. And I could have called those anything. I could have just said connect A, B, C. And it pulls the three positional fields of the connect out, and it assigns them to those new values. 
And so here uh, we have a new version of transform statement that calls the match operator and it has a case specially for connect and in all other cases it recurses. So uh, here this is you know one the hands-on part. Uh, so if you want to uh, try and finish this transform and partialize connect, uh, you can go ahead, but I'm going to go ahead uh, in a little bit. But this is kind of more if someone wants to try this offline uh, once the slides are posted. Okay, so now answer a little too quick. Um, but in order to uh, partialize connect in our transform, we can actually just match every connect in the circuit and we can replace it with a partial connect. And conveniently enough, even though I don't have time to pop through all the IR definitions, partial connect actually takes the exact same arguments as a connect as a kind of more general meaning. And so this just re directly replaces every connect with a partial connect. And uh, in here you'll notice we have a default case, and so if you don't have any kind of unapply or pattern that might restrict the values that a case might match, then it'll match anything. So if you just give it an identifier, then that default case just assigns whatever it matched to the identifier. Any expression can match to that successfully. And I call the recursive, uh, I recurse and map transform statement on the statement I just matched and descend further into the tree. I don't do this for partial connect because a partial connect does not have any statement children. So this is kind of a pattern that comes up a lot in the fertile transforms, which is that you end up having different conditions that you want to handle for different statements. If you're looking at the connectivity in the circuit, you might have a special case for a connect. But some of them have recursive calls, some of them don't. Generally, a lot of passes work with things like connects and work with things like declarations. Neither of those has the capability to have statement as children, so a lot of the mappers that you see in fertile transforms don't have more than one recursive call. And so putting this together, we can replace our unimplemented transform statement function. And now if we just put this pattern matching expression directly as the value of the function, then we end up uh, with a complete transformation, but we made our circuit worse. So can we do the opposite? Can we lower some partial connect statements? So if we look at this uh, transform statement function, the easiest thing we do is we could say, okay, I have match on connect, replace it with partial connect with the same arguments. I just flip that around and then I have match on a partial connect, replace it with a connect with the same arguments. The problem is this doesn't always work. So as I said, partial connects are more general than connects. Sometimes you can replace a partial connect with a connect. If you have a left-hand side and a right-hand side that match in their type, then you know that it's okay to use a regular connect operator because the semantics of the connect operator are that the left-hand side gets exactly the value of the right-hand side. The semantics of the partial connect operator are that some parts of the left-hand side gets, get connected to some parts of the right-hand side. And both of these get a little bit more complicated with things like bundles because fertile, much like chisel, defines bidirectional connects. But if the types match, you can replace the partial connect with the connect just fine. So in order to do this, do we have to look through every single module, look at the declarations, and then look at the connects, look at what they refer to, and figure out, oh, are the types of these two things the same? So we don't have to do that because a lot of people have faced the same problem before. So the IR nodes have analysis fields. And type of an expression is one of the most common analyses that you'll encounter. So it's actually wrapped directly in the fertile IR nodes. So here we have uh, kind of the definition of the reference case class, and it has, you know, if, if the reference, all it is, is it's saying, you know, here's an identifier, and I'm a reference to that identifier. All you really need for that is a name.
but the definition of the IR node includes a type as well. And since the type is an abstract member of the expression uh, class as well, every single type of expression has this type available. Uh, an important distinction to note is that if you look at something like a definition of a wire, it also has a type field. A type is an intrinsic part of a statement that declares something. It appears in the IR itself when you write it in a file. It shows up like this. You have, you know, colon UN32. It cannot be unknown type because fertile does not infer declaration type. So if you have a statement that defines something, it has to include the type. However, uh, fertile does have whip inference, and this is something that, you know, the combination of the fact that we have types of analyses and types in declarations, and the fact that we also have whip inference kind of confuses people sometimes to maybe think that there is type inference. But a statement that has a type, that is part of how the circuit would be written out in legal fertile. In contrast, the what I'm calling analysis type, and that's just I just made that up now, uh, appears in the expression, and that is attached to it with an ephemeral analysis. And this appears in the in-memory representation, but it does not appear in the serialized IR in the file. So if we have an example of a reference, as I said, it's just an identifier, so like X is a reference, it does not contain any type information in the serialized IR. It can be unknown type, and that doesn't mean that the expression lacks a type. It means that the type has not yet been analyzed. So now that I've shown you that we have this nice free analysis that gives us a really important piece of information without us having to figure it out, we can put that to work. And so uh, here is a sketch of another little transform that's also in the uh, example repository. Uh, called Remove Trivial Partial Connects. And this takes as an input high form. And so I've also put that the output form is high form. And this is another example of why the form API is annoying. This transform does one thing, which is it attempts to remove some of the partial connects. Now, because it doesn't remove all the partial connects that it could, it might not actually be sufficiently getting rid of all the partial connects in the circuit. But if you did do that, you still wouldn't be able to make the output form any different because you don't know what other high form features are used in the input. So if you have a transform that lowers something and it doesn't lower everything, then the output form has to be the same as the input form. And this can be very annoying to keep track of it works for the built-in transforms because they are organized into logical components, but it can be really difficult if you're writing something yourself. And so this will get better with the dependency API, uh, but now we have this new part, uh, transform statement function, and it matches instead on partial connects. But we just learned we don't want to lower all the partial connects, so if we just replace that uh, unimplemented expression with a connect, then it will just apply that to every single partial connect and will get potentially an incorrect circuit. However, uh, Scala also allows pattern matching cases to have guard expressions. And these can refer to the new identifiers that were just matched with the unapply. So we can do some expression on L and R, and now I've switched to L and R because it's really hard to fill the code on the slide. But we can do some expression on L and R, and we can decide whether or not we want the code in the body of that particular case to apply. And so presumably what we want to do is figure out, is the thing trivial? And if it is, then we want to replace it. And so uh, if you want to try this on your own, uh, this is in remove trivial partial connects.scala in GCD tools, and uh, there are make targets to check it. And so now I'm going to talk about a few more fertile transform APIs. So 
The one thing that uh, might be a little bit confusing is that there is a different set of IR nodes called working IR. And these are actually a distinct set of case classes. Not every IR node has a special working IR form, but it primarily augments expression nodes with extra info. So an example of this, we have reference. If we look at the working IR form of reference, then all of a sudden we have a W ref. And this is something that if you look at a fertile transform, most of the fertile transforms actually operate on working IR. So if they want to match a reference, they actually match a W ref. So it has these extra fields. It has kind and flow. So kind is what sort of component the reference points to. It could be reg kind, port kind, instance kind. And here that means if you have a reference X, what kind of component is X? If X is registered, then the WRF will have reg kind. We also have flow, which is whether the thing referred to syncs or sources data, or potentially both. Uh, so there's source flow, sync flow, and duplex flow. Uh, another, you know, hot topic in furl development now is why would you have both IR and working IR case classes? So these extra fields are merely analyses, much like the type. You have a type in a regular furl expression. When you parse the circuit, you don't know the type of every expression. They can be invalidated. You can fill in unknown kind and unknown flow. And if you want to handle them, you actually have to have different unapplied passes, or sorry, unapplies, even in passes that don't care about the analysis. And because people don't want to duplicate their code, and because uh, you know it's a little bit ungainly to write things resembling fall through case statements in Scala, then you end up having a lot of passes that don't actually care about what's in working IR versus regular IR, but only work on one or the other. And so the answer is, uh, this is kind of a little bit of a wart now, and uh, you know things get a little easier in the future. But if we absorb those fields into regular IR, then we can, you know, as an example of why it is uh, difficult to support big open source projects, then we can add adapters. We can have deprecation schedules, and so we can try and make everyone happy and make everyone's lives a little easier if they're writing for all transforms. And uh, key insight is that what makes it easier to do things like this is pass order management with this dependency API that I keep bringing up. And so let's say you have a transform that only wants to operate on memories. Then one tool that you can use, now you know it's a WRF it, it refers to memory will have mem kind filled out. And again, this depends on your path having run after the path that fills out the analysis. And so this is where knowing the existing fertile transforms really can, can pay big dividends. But let's say you've run that transform and it's filled in the mem kind field. Then when you match, or sorry, filled in the kind field, when you match on a WRF, if you hear, and so, this is just a general Scala pattern. This is a little bit weird, but if you have a pattern matching statement, the convention is that if you have a lowercase initial letter in the thing, in the unapply, that's an identifier that you want to capture the value that appears there. If it's initial capital, it's a value that you want that positional argument to match. And so here, if I, because it starts with a capital letter, by writing it this way, I'm saying match this if and only if this position argument, the kind, matches mem kind. And so at the beginning, I talked about patterns for using annotations to drive transforms. And I'm going to uh, give you a pretty accelerated look at this. But again, in the repository, this is at uh, Resilient Registers. Scala and it kind of processes the annotations, figures out what registers it needs to change, and then uh, applies the transformation only to them. So again, uh, 
If we look at this resilient register annotation, we want that to control our transform. So how does it actually do that? So if we look at the definition of an annotation, I think Adam also put this in his talk, but some of you might not have seen that. But the resilient register annotation that is defined here, it takes a target. And this extend single target annotation is just a useful API that defines patterns that are for annotations that only operate on one thing. So in this case, we have one annotation for one register, so it's a single target annotation. So we extend that and we get some helper functions. And one thing that you have to define is a duplicate method. And so I said earlier, if you have multiple passes that use annotations to control their, their activities, then you want one to inform the other, hey, I made some new components, update your annotations accordingly. If you have a target, and here a reference target points at a component in a modular instance, like a register or a wire, if you have that stored in the target field, and then the name of the component is stored in target.ref, then when the annotation gets a rename, this duplicate method will get called, and it will update it to have uh, the new appropriate target. So if you have a transform that renames all the registers, these duplicate methods will get called on the annotations, they'll get the appropriate new target, and it will return a new version of the annotation that points at the newly renamed register. And so uh, the duplicate method propagates information when the target is renamed, potentially also to split, merge, other more complicated operations. Oh, sorry, one thing is that uh, this is a single target annotation, so if you have one target, then if you split your register into three copies, you're going to end up with three different single target annotations, not one pointing at three of them. Uh, and so uh, how would you actually use this to control your transform? So I'm not going to show the, the whole transform because it's a little bit too much code. Uh, but if you have your execute method, a lot of the execute methods in uh, existing transforms, the first thing they do is they will iterate through all the annotations in the circuit. And here I'm using a collect method, uh, which is just a general Scala collections thing. And it's like a map, but it only returns values from the, so this anonymous function that's applying to every element um, is actually only defined on the resilient register annotation. If it hits any other annotation, it falls through, and it doesn't match, and the function is actually undefined. Collect takes a function that's only defined in some places and develops a list only out of the results that are actually defined. So here, if I take all the annotations and collect, then this just gives me a list of the targets of the resilient register annotations. And so the next thing I can do is I can map the module name to a list of the registers that are targeted. And so here I'm kind of interchangeably using register and target because what actually represents the registers in the annotation is just a reference target. But if I generate this map, I can take my list of uh, I can take my list of targets and do a built-in collection group by operator, and that basically gives me a map where whatever the result of this function that I pass is the key. And so, uh, sorry, that might have been a little confusing, but basically, if I do group by uh, module, then I'm saying take all these targets apply this function that extracts the module and use that as a key to a map. And if they're the same, make a list of them. And so now if I have this map, I can pass that along to my statement transformer and say, hey, if I hit a register definition, make sure the name matches one of the target names before I transform it. So how would I pass that to the statement mapper? So here I have on statement, generic, could do anything. What do I do? Well, I add an extra parameter, uh, you know, my, my useful info that I want to pass in. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. 
And this is a big uh, thing that trips people up when they look at kind of the coding idioms that go in fertile transforms. Uh, a map is not type parameterizable. If you have a map on, if you call map on a statement, there are different flavors of map for different types of children, but they are not parameterizable. They are overloaded. There is a finite number of them. And for the sake of discussion, I'm talking about uh, mapping a statement to a statement. The appropriate mapper for that expects a function of type statement to statement. There is no way to change that. So if I add this extra parameter to my statement transformer, then it no longer has the right type. And so there are multiple ways to work around this. You can define different functions that call each other and then end up having like a big mutually recursive piece of code. But that ends up getting big and ungainly. And people who write the fertile transforms, myself included, are guilty sometimes of like, we really hate things that have lots of lines of code because then it doesn't fit in your screen and then, then the bugs creep in. <laughs> and so what you end up seeing a lot are additional parameter lists. And this uh, makes it kind of difficult sometimes to just like get into writing a fertile transform. Because I give an example of something like the partialized connect. That can be very useful, but most of those transforms take the form of like raising or lowering the circuit or like homogeneously applying some kind of very simple transformation across it. Most of the transforms that do that and are useful already exist. If you have a new problem that you want to solve, you probably actually have to look at the circuit when you're changing elements of it. And so this construct, even though it's kind of really simple to write, is a little bit complicated. And what it actually means is that if you call on statement and you pass it the info parameter, the, that gives you a partially applied function that then you can apply this second statement parameter to, and it will actually uh, do the correct operation to it. So if you want to carry any information in your transform, then you have to define additional parameter lists, and you will have to pass them into the recursive calls as well. And so basically all this is saying is, hey, I want this analysis as my first argument. Every time I call a function, call partially apply with this argument to create a return type that is appropriate to pass to the mapper. And so uh, finally, I'm going to talk just a little bit about renames and a rename, uh, so we had these annotations and now we're looking just at the targets that point at the uh, registers in the design. So if we had a resilient register annotation, it's got targets for some components, maybe more than one. And then you want to split them up. Uh, and the way that this is done is with a rename map. So the rename map actually has a very minimal API. It's kind of a container of many magical things that handle a lot of complexities of actually dealing with parts of the circuit, changing name, making multiple copies. So all you really need to know is if you have a rename map, then you record, using the record method, either one or a list of new targets. If you take something in your circuit and you split it into three, then you would record the old target and make a sequence of three new targets. If you delete it, then you could potentially rename the old to an empty list. If you rename it once, you can rename the old one to the new one. And those pieces together, the annotation traversal, the secondary parameter list, and the uh, rename map are kind of the things that pop into a more complicated transform that actually is controlled by annotation and make it very hard to interpret for something that hasn't seen the fertile transforms before. So unfortunately, uh, I was going to prep a two-hour version of this, and I got a little heavy-handed cutting this down to fit one hour. I thought when I practiced it, it would go a little longer, but it looks like I went pretty far under. But uh, if anyone has any questions, I would love to answer them, or just like I could pull open the code for this and talk about what various things do. Thank you.
dimensional. Um, so when I call the, the register representative uh, working consultant, uh, I couldn't help but think that next logical, possible next logical enhancement would be uh, not just, uh, for example, to destroy a particular register from a particular module, but I have some sort of utility metric that I'm trying to maximize. Uh, say, for example, the probability of serverability of a particular signal, I have more utility, and then I have some cost metric that comes from the uh, area. So that will need the synthesis or simulation. And so what we could suggest uh, could be a possible flaw or two. And that doesn't necessarily need to converge. It could diverge, but so that's that. Yeah, so I think there are a couple things that I see as if you want to write a tool that does that, what the interesting parts of it are. So one is that uh, if you can write a CAD tool in one fertile pass, it's probably better to write it using more fertile passes. Sometimes it's hard. But basically what you've described as <clears throat> this kind of optimization problem that is inexact in the solution it provides, the concern of that piece of software is basically analyzing the circuit, perhaps analyzing the output of simulation, and then producing annotations. And so uh, I apologize for this repo. A lot of stuff is nested pretty deep in uh, because it has all the just like regular Java project organization stuff. But here, the actual, um, the actual control of the path is through annotations, and uh, one way that you can provide annotations to your compilation flow is just by giving an input JSON file. And so here, I just have these serialized annotations, and you can have an arbitrary program annotate. You can have it be a fertile transformation. You can have it be out of band uh, generated by your simulation infrastructure. But there is very good ability to tie uh, tools that don't know anything about fertile but have very specific and valuable information about the circuit and connecting them through annotations to parts of the fertile compiler. I think one of the things I kept talking about repeatedly is that ordering transforms is really hard and uh, this dependency API, like it's, the goal is not to make it so that you can kind of dynamically change what you've invalidated and have it be rerun. That, is very hard to reason about. And so the kind of answer to that is that you don't want to have like an individual stage of your flow be very dynamic and have iterative parts. There are two patterns that people do. One is you can have a transform that in its execute method calls another transform. And that's actually surprisingly common. And so you could have a transform that uses this resilient registers transform and calls its execute method on the circuit state and then calls some other program that gets simulation results and then passes it uh, as annotations back into the circuit and just reruns it. So that's if you want to just like black box like this thing does exactly what you want. Another thing is that the whole flow has stages and phases and those can run more than once. Uh, so we, we do, there are built-in things that run iteratively. There are lots of examples of CAD tools and other uh, pieces of infrastructure generating annotations and that being used to control. Uh, but the thing that is really missing from a lot of these things is we have a lot of ability to write tools like that, but what we don't have is the black box that looks at the outputs of some traditional CAD tool and gives us all the numbers to feed into the optimization problem. Like, the, the hardest thing about doing things like retiming in Fertile is actually, you know, developing a piece of software that can interpret the results of your placing route and actually, you know, produce meaningful inputs to that. So I think um, certainly there are a lot of people who are interested in doing things like that. And if you, um, you know, what we really need is collaborating on, like, how to do the math behind it more than more than just the software. Yep. 
I mean, if you just wanted to get the numbers out, you could use hammer to do that, then you could. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Albert.